Father God, what a song covered with your life. And we're going to be digging into that concept of God's vengeance versus God's mercy. Hope versus fear. And Lord, we pray that the, our viewers from all over the world, Michael from Trinidad and even Gomez from Bermuda, who are new to our platform, that they'll share their views and others who are consistently here with us. Lord, we pray that this ministry will not die, um, but it will grow, it will flourish. And we pray, Lord, that at the end of the day, the purpose is not to showcase, but is that each of us will evaluate our lives and recognize that we need Jesus in our hearts. So, Father God, bless everything we do in this church. Bless this platform. Multiply it. And, Lord, may we have enough resources to continue. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Royston, and thank you, Brother Everill, for reminding us where we need to look and where we need to focus on. That, of course, is Jesus. So we're now at um, lesson number 12 in our journey, and, and Elder Peter had summarized the book of Isaiah so, so well in his introduction. So we're now at um, lesson number 12, and this week's lesson is entitled Desire of Nations. When I see that, those of you who are Adventists, you must think of that powerful book by Sister White, Desire of Ages. It's talking about the same person, the desire of nations. Our memory verse comes to us this week from Isaiah uh, chapter 60, verse 3, and the New King James Version reads, The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. We're going to get into that a little later on. Now, Sabbath afternoon's introduction, uh, it looked at um, an excerpt from Sister Ellen G. White's book, Faith and works, and it said, nothing but his, that's Christ, nothing but his righteousness it can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. We have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them, listen to this, because we have cherished the idea that we can do something to make ourselves worthy of them. It goes on to say, when we trust God fully, when we rely on the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior, we shall receive all the help that we can desire. Powerful words. Pastor, you know where it says, when we rely on the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior, please expand for us, uh, if you may, about the reliance on the merits of Jesus. Uh, Elder Johnny, I, I've written down um, three Bible texts that will explain, you know, this, this reliance. John 3.16 mm. is, is a text, is a well-known text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Um, there's another one that I've written on Isaiah 53, same Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I've also written Matthew 27, 46. Um, Eli, Eli, Alama Saskbai, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So I've put those three Bible verses to, to say that um, it is his merit. Mm. It is his merit why we um, are experiencing salvation. I mean, Paul says in, um, also in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, it is not by works. Mm. You know, it is, it is by grace that we are saved, you know, and, and not of ourselves, but it is a gift of God. So salvation um, comes because of what Christ has done, what Christ is, is doing. So you and I, we're just recipient of God's, um, unmerited favor, which is what we call grace to each of us. Powerful, powerful. We got some good text there. Listeners, viewers, you heard what Pastor says. Do you agree with him? You know, what does reliance on the merits of Jesus mean for you? We're looking forward to hearing your comments and don't forget to send in your questions as well. But let us know what does the reliance on the merits of Jesus mean for you? 
as we start our Sabbath School discussion. We're looking forward to hearing your comments and your questions. So we're looking at Isaiah 59 now. Um, Elder Peter, I'm going to come to you first of all. Open for us with verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah 59, please. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, reads, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So when we consider Isaiah 59... Um, it's split into three sections. We've got verses 1 to 8 talking about sin, verses 9 to 15 talking about confession, and verses 16 to 21 talking about redemption. And this text is quite clear. Verse 1 is telling us that the Lord is actually capable. As an omnipotent God, he's able to save, he's able to hear. Then verse 2 gets to the crux of the matter. It explains that we have a God who wants to relate to us, but we're unable to see his face. Mm. Not because he's hiding it from us, but our sins are hiding his face from us. Mm. Now this verse states that our sins are hiding his face from us so that he will not hear. In verse one, we've already established he's capable of saving and hearing, but the more we sin, the larger the wedge is that we put between ourselves and God making it difficult for him to reach us. And as 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 puts it, it's like we're looking through a glass oh, darkly. darkly. Mm -hmm. God will always see us clearly, but if we harbor sin in our lives, we will not see him. Wow, wow. You, you, you use that word wedge there. Wedge definitely is something that keeps something apart, a, a, a separation. S Sister Nicole, I'm coming to you. You know, remind us of the initial impact of man's separation from God in Genesis 3, verse 8, please. Yes, so I'm reading, Brother Johnny, from the New King James Version, Genesis 3, verse 8, and it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the, the tree of the garden. And we see here that both Adam and Eve are experiencing shame and that shame was was bred through separation from God simply put they were ashamed of facing God because they were aware that they had done wrong and we see how that original sin manifested itself down the line and if I could just piggyback on on Elder Peter's verses because what this shows is that uh, um, there's not an inability on God's part. However, it is our iniquities, it is our sin that has caused the separation and that now breeds the shame. See, Adam and Eve knew, they heard that God was coming. He wanted to be with them. It's a beautiful imagery of a seeking God. Mm. And this is how the Lord God wanted to fellowship with Adam and Eve. It's the same way he, he wants to fellowship with us in a natural and close and an intimate way, which is wonderful. But, but this shame that we see here in Genesis manifested itself in a way that Adam and Eve drives themselves away from God. And we know that their covering was inadequate. It was completely inadequate. They were embarrassed before God. So instead of running to him and repenting and seeking forgiveness from sin, they ran away from him and hid. Yes, deep. Thank you for just reminding us of that start. Um, of, of what happened. And as I said, there, there's extra words coming out there, shame, and as a result, there was an action. Elder Stanley, let me not say anything more. Anything you want to add in terms of the effects of sin from what we are picking up from these verses? I think that, uh, I, I will agree with what uh, Elder Peter has said and uh, Sister Nicole. But one thing we need to know that sin is something that we need to run away from. The effect of sin we can see is that it quenches the Holy Spirit. Our Bible studies becomes unfruitful, unfruitful because of the barrier of sins. It robs us of our joy of the Lord and it robs us of our peace because when you're sinning, you are not at peace with yourself. 
And also that loss of confidence when we pray, it becomes a barrier when you pray to your God because there are some sins you have not confessed. So there is a lot of faith and as Christians, we need to walk away from it. But again, if you look at 50, Isaiah 59 verse one, it says, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. So there is hope. Amen, there is hope. Strong words there, robs us of the joy of our Lord. Wow, thank you. Um, Pastor, has anything come in as yet from our online <coughs> viewers and listeners? There has. Um, somebody suggests about um, that our greatest need is, uh, we, need, we need a vaccine, but they're saying the greatest need to, to drive away the challenges we have is the blood of Christ. Um, the greatest need for mankind today, and this is from um, our live stream, is not economic success, um, but it, it is a reliance on, on, on Christ. Um, on Christ, the assurance that life beyond the grave um, can only be accomplished in Christ. Juliet says it's not about feelings, feelings change, it is faith. Yeah. And she says faith is built on the rock. And she mentioned the rock as being Christ. Um, Sister Margaret says only Jesus' grace and righteousness can save us. She says reliance on Jesus is totally surrender, surrendering every aspect, every aspect right of my life to him. As Pastor Smith says, it is a gift, we either accept it or Rejected. I like what Doreen says uh, on, on YouTube. She says, Jesus' precious blood was spilt on the, on the cross for our sin. It is that blood that daily cleanses us. I like that. We must continue in prayer for Jesus to keep us safe and free from sin. So she, she's talking about um, justification, mm -hmm. sanctification, and eventually glorification. Um, Sun Sun says, due to separation uh, from sin, God's God, sin, sin challenges our faith and feelings. John the Baptist questioned his faith in prison, hence Jesus gave assurance of his work. Happy Sabbath, Pastor Smith and, and your team join, just joining from Jamaica. Welcome, um, Sister, Sister Louise Atkinson. David Billet said, sin is naturally consumed in the presence of, um, of God's power. God, God hides himself so that, we, so that we, when filled with sin, are not destroyed with that sin. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, somebody on the panel talked about the reason why we're not seeing God's face. Yes. And, and that for that very reason, God, God, God hides himself. Here's another point, and then I, there's a question. I, I, I will give the question, and then you, sure. then you can reflect on it. Sin is expensive, painful, and destructive. Sin destroys our relation with God and with our fellow human being. We should flee from sin. It is a monster which consumes even the owner mm. of sin. And I think that's a very powerful thought. Now, can I just read the final point? Um, Rufus um, says, reliance on Jesus merit means hearing, knowing, experiencing the love of God, which found me in the dungeon of sin and helplessness and imparting his arms of grace to save me and give me hope. Amen. Can we highlight that? Um, <laughs> can we ask to highlight that and make that one of the comments of the day? Mm. Because really that is reflecting yes. um, what the lesson is saying. So here's a question from Roxy. Roxy's over there in Nigeria. She has been with us since last March. Amen. Um, very good friend of mine. We speak quite often. Um, she says, what does it mean to plead the merit of the blood of Jesus Christ? It's a very simple question. Um, but it's a very um, pertinent one. And thanks, welcome, Lorona. Let us know where you're from. Nice to see you. Over to you, Elder Johnny. So the question is, what does it mean to plead the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ? Now, Pastor, at the start, you kind of explained to us the concept of the merit. And it's, you can't describe that without using the word grace. Um, and so... When you say what, when you say, ask the question, what does it mean to plead the, the, the merits? The word plead seems to imply that we are begging. When I think of plead, I think of begging, that we're, we are begging for the blood of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we know that the gift of God is offered free. And as we discussed last week, there's no freeness, but it's offered free, but it's up to us to accept it. So the word that stands out for me here that needs to be defined is this word plead. And to me, this is about where we are at and recognizing that we are full of sin and we are condemned. And unless we are 
put ourselves in the right place to be able to take on the, the, the merits and the merits of the blood of Jesus, we then wouldn't be able to be cleansed from this. I'm looking at my panelists. So if, if you want to jump in, Elder Peter, I could see you. Um, you can jump in. So we're, we're answering the question, what does it mean to plead the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ? Pete. Sure. As I, as I think of that question, um, as you said, to plead is to beg for something. Mm. When we think of the merits, we, 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 a meritocracy is where somebody is given something based on their merit, their qualification. Now, when we think that Jesus was the one qualified mm. to save us from our sins, when we plead with him, it's almost like going to a rich person who, who has earned their money through hard graft. And we say, please, please, can you lend me this so that I can buy that? Please, can you lend me something? So we're going to Christ and say, you're the one that's got it. Can you please give me some of it? And we know that the reason, the reason you've earned it, the merit, is your blood. You paid for it with your blood. Just mm -hmm. like people will pay for things with, with, with their money. They say, please, can I have some of that so that I could be a little bit along the journey to where you are? Yes, good, good, good. Um, Pastor, did you have anything to add in terms of pleading? Well, the merits of blood well you see, I'm getting some comments, powerful comments. I'd rather read the comments from our, from our listeners. Go um, ahead. Um, and it says here, um, to plead is to argue a case. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like that idea. Or somebody says it's to practice something. Um, somebody says, um, because sin crippled us from moving forward in life. Or somebody says, because sin separates us. So um, I'm, I'm liking the idea coming in that when you, it's to beseech, it's to mark in, in, a, in a humble manner. Yes. You know? You know, so, so the sense of, of pleading the merits, you know, it's, it's we, are, we are saying to God, uh, we're accepting. I like what Loy says. I think it means accepting the merit of the blood which is available to us. Great question. Great question. Thank you for your answers. Hopefully you're, you're, you're on the same track as our sister, uh, Roxy, I think. It was Roxy. Rufus. It's a Roxy from Nigeria. From yes. Nigeria. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, I've got a question for you, uh, listeners and viewers. Although the impact of past sin can remain for a lifetime. What words would you use to encourage a fellow believer who keeps thinking of past sin? So bear in mind what we just spoke about in terms of pleading. So I'm, I'm asking you then, although the, you know, the impact of sin can, can be there for a long time, what words would you use to encourage a fellow believer who keeps thinking of past sin? Let's have your answers to that question. Um, moving on now, Elder Peter spoke earlier about the sections of Isaiah. So verses 3 to 14 of Isaiah continue on the impact of sin and separation from God. But from verse 15, however, there is a change of narrative. So Sister no Nicole, I'm coming to you, please. If you pick up for us from verses 15 through to 18 of Isaiah 59. Certainly. And it reads, verse 15... So truth fails, and, who, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him. That there was no justice, he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with the zeal as a cloak. Verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastland he will fully repay. And, and as you stated, uh, Brother Johnny, verses 3 to 14 continues to show that impact of sin and, you know, that separation from God. And, and it says, our sins testifies against us and righteousness stands afar off. So there we, there had been a reality check. You know, things are now in plain sight. God's shortened hand and heavy ears couldn't be blamed. Uh, they knew it's because of their own sin that righteousness was now standing afar off. Not only was the state of God's people bad, but no one among them uh, took the lead in getting it right. 
The passages beg the question, where was the person to lead the people into righteousness? No one could be found. Where was that intercessor who could plead um, um, plead God's case to the people? Um, God's case to the people and, and, and the people's repentance to God. Mm. No intercessor could be found. And so God readied himself in the full armor. And we see that same armor in Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 17 in preparation for battle. Well, this is God's um, armor anyway. It's his, you know, and we see God girds himself in deciding to bring righteousness and salvation, even though the people had abandoned the covenant. Um, additionally, his salvation also comes along with judgment to the wicked. And I wanted to just add that it is so wonderful to know that our Heavenly Father, even though we sin and we have fallen short of his glory, he is ready and willing to fight for us so that we can be saved. Amen. God readied himself in full armor. Powerful imagery. Thank you. Elder Stanley, let's carry on, please. Um, verses 19 through to 21 of Isaiah 59. Okay, Isaiah 59, 19 to 21. I'm reading from King James Version. It says, So shall they fear for the name of the Lord from west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the redeemer shall come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression. In Jacob, said the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, said the Lord my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I put in my, thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, said the Lord from henceforth and forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So if you look at these verses, it's talking about forgiveness is offered and the key to redemption. So all is telling us that the importance for us to repent and the desire to abandon sin uh, true for repentance. So it's uh, calling us for us to repent. And I, I think the other verse I need to talk about here is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Say, Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sin is a scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They that be like red, like crystal, they shall be. That, that, so there is point for us. There is reason for us to, to repent from our sin. And God has given us that courage for us to move away from sin mm. and be cleansed. Amen. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elder Peter, bearing in mind then, you know, bearing this in mind, what we've just read, what hope about God's judgment does the Apostle Paul give in Romans 3, 21 through to 24? Famous verses, but let, let's link them together, please. Sure. Romans 3, verses 21 to 24, and so, so I'm using the New International Version today. Um, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That's right. Now, based on what we've discovered in Isaiah 59, sin is serious. Yes. Even when sins are confessed and we've been redeemed, we're still hit with that stark reality in Romans 3, verse 23, that all That's have right. sinned and fall short of God's glory. Now, if we fall short, does that not mean that we haven't reached a mark and we are therefore doomed? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how some people measure a spiritual life. They base it on what they do. But verse 24 counteracts all of that with the hope of redemption leading to our salvation when it declares that all are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Jesus. Our righteousness cannot be earned. That is law. Otherwise, none of us could repay the fact that we have sinned and have to therefore pay the cost for that sin, which is death. Um, but it's a strong belief or faith that one has in Jesus, which is a grace that makes one righteous, knowing that the one who can save us yes. actually 
wants to save us Amen. is an amazing feeling. It's basically saying that it's impossible to lose when we are participants on the side of team success. Oh, wow. Wow. Team success. That's so mm. well explained. And again, it's this... Um, it's a common theme that we see, you know, verse 23, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Is that Romans 3? But anyway, you, you follow what I'm, I'm saying there. Thank, th thank you very much for explaining that so well. Pastor, let's go back to our comments coming. I think a few comments. Thank you, um, Croydon's um, host, uh, highlighting a few things. Um, Angela um, Hannan says, um, Jeremiah 31, 34 says, the Lord will forgive our iniquity and remember us no more. If God has forgive, forgotten, we need to accept that and move on. Mm -hmm. In relation to your question, Margaret's comment has been highlighted. Um, um, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. If, if, if looking on past sin to evaluate where we have come from and how God has and, and is leading us, powerful thought. Um, another one highlighted here from Tandy. Um, it, it is not fine, but, but not if we hold on to the past sin. In other words, we need to let go. Um, Earlene over there in... Um, over there in Canada, said, all have sinned, every last one of us, uh, th then who is forgiven? When does forgiveness come in? And, and, and I think the point is, um, but I like what Mark says, Mark in Bristol, and I baptized Mark two years ago. See, Mark says, when I'm troubled with sin, I fall to the ground genuinely, I love this, pleading to, pleading to the Lord, asking for mercy, and to send the Holy Spirit to come into me for guidance and for correction. Risca 9924 9, says, I would share John 8, 11. They are no longer condemned. Go and sin no more. What's done is done. You have been forgiven. Help them to focus on their repentant yes. life now. I think it's the story yes. of the woman caught in that of adultery, Elder Johnny. Um, over there on live stream, um, Clive says, we begin to hate sin with the knowledge that it separates us from God. Um, Alana said, I would show them the promise in 1 John 1, 9. Um, Elder Moambi says, God forgives our sins and remembers them no more, for I will forgive their sins, wickedness, and will remember them no more. Croydon SD Outreach made this very point. I would encourage someone with Isaiah 43, 25, which says, I am he who blots out your transgression right. for my own namesake, and I will not remember them any more. And finally, Chitura Wugu says, I, I'll remind the person that if we confess our sins, I think that is 1 John 1, 9. Mm -hmm. He, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right. There's a sinking there between um, live stream and, 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 um, and, and, um, YouTube. and YouTube. But here, I think I have a text here, Elder Johnny, that says, um, just a thought about trying to understand the character of God. All right, I think we will come back to this one sure. because it is not in sync with the question that, that you have raised. Sure, great, great answers there. And when we, we, we remember, it's the evil one that's trying to keep people in that, in that well, keep people hidden then. Let's, let, let's stick with that theme, keep people hidden by making them feel, feel they're not worthy. But, you know, powerful answers there. It's about recognizing that, you know, your, 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 your sins have been uh, dropped into the deepest part of the ocean and God doesn't remember them anymore. So let, let's, let's be... Can I read the WhatsApp? Because go, go I, ahead, it's sir. unfair not to give WhatsApp a chance. Go ahead, um, go ahead. Elder Bennett says, just a thought about trying to understand the character of God. I think it must be in a reflection of forgiveness and sin. Um, in the book of Job, Satan turned up to the council of the universe. Um, Satan was God's arch enemy, but yet God permitted Satan to enter the meeting of the universe because Satan came to represent the earth because Adam and Eve, because of Adam and, Adam and Eve's disobedience. Oh, okay. Satan hijacked our, for, our, our four parents and therefore had the right by default to come enter, but God permitted him. What a God we serve. Yes, that's, so, that's so on God, the merits. The, the yeah. whole idea of yeah. God's fairness yes. and, and justice. Um, yes, and yes, over to you, great, Johnny. Great, thank you. Oh, we've got a wonderful class as usual, and I've got another question for you. In an earthly court, um, a verdict of guilty or not guilty um, is given for the crime being investigated. Now, considering we've all sinned, as, as was said before, but Jesus removed our condemnation by dying for all, what does a guilty verdict in the heavenly court really say? Yeah? In, in, in other words, when you think about what Christ has already done for us, 
who were condemned and removing that condemnation, what then, when that final judgment in the heavenly court, when the verdict of guilty comes out, what is that really saying about salvation and the story and the love of Christ, etc., etc.? Let me have your thoughts on that because that, that really struck me when I thought about it. That Anyway, let me not say any more. You, 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 you share your thoughts. What, what does a, a guilty verdict in the heavenly court really say, bearing in mind the, the, the story of salvation? Um, we're, we're moving into Isaiah chapter 60 now. Um, Elder Stanley, I'm coming to you. What's the message in the opening three verses of Isaiah 61 to 3, if you can start there for me, please. Okay. Uh, can I read it? Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of God is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and cross darkness the people. But the Lord shall risen upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And all the Gentiles shall come to that light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. So, it, it's a very powerful verse, but who are we, who is going to be, who has that commandment be given, our prophets to be given to arise? That's what we have to look at, is the children of Israel, and likewise to the, then the light is come, whose light, then the glory of God is risen. Then you want to look at the verse two, he said, for behold, Darkness shall cover the earth and cross darkness the people, but the Lord shall reason. So when I look at that, I said the light is light of God. We have been asked to arise from every situation we are. And the light of God is the gospel, is God's holiness, is righteousness, is God's presence. That's the light. So when you look at Matthew 5, 14 to 6, it says, you are the light of the world, mm. and the city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither the men that light the candle put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give it the light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Then the glory is a character of God. Then we talk about darkness here. Darkness of the world is sin. Darkness of not having the knowledge of God, our Savior. Isaiah 60, verse 2 says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and cross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen. So once that light comes, that darkness disappears. Then we look at the Gentiles shall come to the light, and the king to the brightness of their rising. We are called to represent Christ our Lord. So if you look at Genesis 12, 1 to 3, it says, Now that the Lord has said unto Abraham, Go thee out of the, thy country from thy kindred from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless thee that bless thee, and cause thee that causes thee, and thee shall all families on earth be blessed. So here, the Gentile will get the blessing once we have the light. But how do we get the light? Staying connected to God. We cannot get have that light without being transformed. We cannot get that light without moving away from sin and connecting to the source of light, which is our God. Okay, thank you. Um, Sister Nicole, I mean, Elder Stanley just read some verses that I wanted you to read in terms of that, the origin. So the, uh, again, just your thoughts on um, where the original arrangement came from in terms of this light, um, as Elder Stanley just read in Genesis 12, um, verses two and three around there. Yes, thank you, Brother Johnny. Would you like me to... Yeah, yeah, happy for you to reread it, yeah. Okay, so I'm reading from Genesis 12, and I'm just focusing on 2 and 3. And it says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curse you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So if we just if we just put it in context, um, chapter 12 commences in verse 1 with God's call to Abram to leave his country and his relatives, and God then promises Abram a land. While God initially chooses one man and his family, his, his final end purpose is to humanity um, with his grace and blessing. Not only was Abram... Um, 
promised blessing, but God also promised to make him a blessing, even to the point where all the families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham. This amazing promise was fulfilled in the Messiah that came through Abraham's lineage. And again, God's blessing to Abraham was not for his own sake, or even for the sake of just the Jewish nation to come. It was for the was and is for the whole earth, for all the families of the earth through Jesus Christ. And what, what a wonderful foresight our, our Savior has, that he saw you and me, all of us, down the, the ages of time to include us in that blessing. Indeed, blessing. And, and as we know, you know, Abraham was definitely blessed. He, he, he wasn't a pauper in any way, shape or form. I mean, Elder Peter, who doesn't want to be blessed? Some could take this, though, as God's approval for prosperity religions and teachings. And these are very prevalent in our society today. Um, now, what's your take on the message of these verses for us in 2021 in terms of blessings? Right. Blessings in 2021. Hmm. Um, earlier in the, in the discussion, we heard someone say everyone wants to be blessed. And we all do want to be blessed. But we can see it again there, team success. Mm. Um, we heard it in Isaiah 60, that God's glory is on us. And coming back to Genesis 12, things sound good. God is on our side, team success. Surely this means that we can be righteous and rich. Job was. Solomon was, Abraham was rich, Isaac was too, just to name a few in the Bible. Now, if God is blessing us, why not preach that prosperity? Hang on a minute. Did Isaiah not say that nations will come to our light? And did the text in Genesis not say that um, people on the earth will be blessed through us? Are we actually blessing others when we take our hard earned money and give it away to people? who may not be doing much or may even be considered as undeserving? Or is it our duty to become rich and give God glory for becoming rich, yet still failing to help where there is great need? Now, the unfortunate um, truth is that some prosperity teachings do not live out the reality of a blessing. Mm. They may quote even the prayer of Jabez, that's in um, 1 Chronicles 4 verse 10, where it says, enlarge my territory. And they think that Jabez is simply referring to physical territory when asking to multiply territory. But the lineage of Jabez actually shows that he's speaking in terms of wealth and prosperity, but not in terms of physical, but in terms of impacting the kingdom of God. Right. Spiritual territory needs to be increased. Now, really, how can a minister justify owning the most expensive vehicles, private jets, personal bodyguards, live in extremely opulent lifestyles when they have members in the church who are making sacrifices, they're struggling to make ends meet, they're too impoverished to even buy appropriate clothing to attend church, yet still they're giving their widow's might offerings when they do attend to keep their ministers maintained in the lifestyle that he or she have become accustomed to. And I might add, the Seventh-day Adventist church isn't organized like that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, other people need to be blessed through us. And that's not only financial giving, but we need to share our time, we need to share our prayers as well. So. Prosperity is good when we use it to the blessing of others. Amen. So uh, thank you for that caveat. As far as I know, our, our pastors of Croydon Church don't have private security and private <laughs> vehicles and private jets and things like that. Um, they are rich in the blessings of, of the Lord. So the, the, the key point before I come to you, Pastor, although Israel were a promised nation. Their job was to enable other nations to be part of the promise or covenant. And this surely is the duty of spiritual Israel too. Over to you, Pastor. I, I wish I had a private security. I wish I had a private jet. So if, if anybody out there is thinking of that for me, well, um, can't wait, Peter, can't wait for that. Thank you very much. Um, the question that you've raised, Elder Johnny, a lot of answers have come in mm -hmm. about... Um, Guilty. About in the heaven, the courts, right? Mm -hmm. um, Alana says, um, it's to say that, they, that we have rejected the gift of eternal life. Mm -hmm. I think um, JB says, said the same thing, that, um, that we have consistently rejected salvation. Margaret Patrick makes the same point. Um, we have Elder Mwambi making the same point. Rufus make, made the same point. 
Um, so the general theme, and uh, you know, um, everybody seems to be making the same point uh, about um, the rejection of Christ, about um, that, 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 you know, that we have turned our backs on, on God, and so God has to make that damning statement. Tibi says, a guilty verdict means we have rejected Christ's offer of salvation and have clung to sin mm. and continuously sinful life. God sees the sin that envelops us at that point and pronounces us guilty. So there's this consistency yeah. that, is, that is running through. Um, Wagu says, guilty verdict means we do not confess and repent. So there's this consistency that is coming through, um, coming through very well. Can, can, Doug, can Doug over there in, um, in um, Scotland says, good morning, El Johnny Pastor and Sabbath 12 lesson team. May the grace of God keep you. Happy Sabbath day in God we trust. Thank you for that. Um, thank, thank you for that. So, so the, the whole idea, um, Elder Johnny, is, is, that, um, is that there's a rejection. Yes. And for God, the eternal judge, the just judge to make that point, then he's very, very fair. Mm -hmm. There's a question, of Elder Johnny, that I've, I've written, and I need to find that question, um, about is there such thing as the unpardonable sin? Patrick D Dodad says, Guilt, a guilty verdict can mean that we have consistently rejected the offer of salvation. Um, so so, so, so that, that, that is the point. Is there such thing as the unpardonable sin? Okay, so that's a question going out there. So panelists, um, let me, let me come to you, Sister Nicole. Um, I, I, I think there's a straightforward answer, but the question is being asked. So the question is being asked by one of our viewers. Is there such a thing as the unpardonable sin? Perhaps you may want to define that as well as answer for us. What do you think? I would start by saying that um, there's a passage in the Bible that says, let those who are just remain just and those who are unjust remain just. And so I think before that moment, we all have an opportunity to come and fall before God. And we spoke about pleading with God for mercy. We all have that opportunity to come to the Lord before that, before that moment of judgment when time is no more. Mm. So I would implore that person, take this opportunity right now. Each day is an opportunity, uh, 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 mercy, um, is renewed every day. Each moment is an opportunity to come to God, to ask for that forgiveness. So we don't get to a moment where time is stopped. This is it. Mm. Judgment is now. And now there is no more pardon for your sins. Mm. Now is the time. Take the opportunity. Yes, thank you. So it's the concept of grieving the Holy Spirit, constant rejection. We kind of touched on that in our discussion before. But remember, while there is still breath in our bodies, while we are still alive, there is still an opportunity for everyone to be able to heed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So yes, there is an unpardonable sin, but let's be sure that we do not commit that sin and we don't assume that somebody has committed it and there's no hope for them either. Go, Pastor. Reflect what the viewers are saying Thank here, you. Our, our, our viewers. Um, Alana says, yes to the vexing of the Holy Spirit is, is on part of as given to us in Math, Mark chapter 3, 28 to 29. Um, Michael P says, if, you're, if your own child repeatedly did wrong, would you cast them away eventually? I think this is the same with God. There's always forgiveness. Tandy says, what we need to understand is that God loves us unconditionally and wants to save us. That's the only reason he hasn't come yet, to give us a chance. How great is our God? Mm. I like that point. Um, and um, Geraldine says, yes, God says there's an unpardonable sin. That is in Mark chapter, Matthew 12, 31. When you continually reject the Holy Spirit voice, he then can hear his plea to come unto him and obtain mercy. I think we need to understand that. We need to understand that. That's critically important. The unpardonable sin is not God turning his back on you. Yes. Can I, I, I don't know if this is an inspirational moment. Go ahead. The unpardonable sin is not God turning his back on you. It's you turning your back on God. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's this constant thing, isn't it? Yes, you, you're saying, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't need, I don't need it anymore. Mm. I don't need you anymore, God. I'm not mm. listening to you. Mm. So the unpardonable sin is not God. God God, God, whilst we were still sinning yes. in Romans, God died for us. Mm. 
God, as a matter of fact, there's no provision made for us to be lost. That's right. We have chosen that's right. to be lost. That's right. So the unpardonable sin, as Clive says, it's, it's, it's beyond our pay grade. Heavenly Father will judge us. He knows the life. Thank you for that, Clive. It is not that God is turning his back on us. Is that we have rejected him, mm. so the unpardonable sin is you That's right. or I letting go of God. And Hel Ellen made the point, reason why Regina Osprey makes it unpardonable sin, God cannot get through to us anymore, so, he, so we have blocked him from reaching us. Yes. Mm. Colette know. makes the point, is you continual rejection of the people of the Holy Spirit. If, the only, if your only source of salvation is water and you refuse to drink water, water is still available. That's right. It is your lacking of drinking that water. So, so Christ has made himself available to save you and you have refused to listen. CC made the point. Hi there, Jesus defined the problem in simple as blasphemy against the spirit, as in attributing of the works of the Holy Spirit, as the works of the demons. So it's you and I who have refused to listen let me move over to the joint. I don't want to be preaching. I'm not preaching at this time, so let, <laughs> I, let me stop. I mean, just to add, a few lessons ago, we studied about King Ahaz, and who am I to judge King Ahaz? But didn't the Lord say to Ahaz, tell me what sign you want. Tell me what sign you want so that I can prove to you that I'm there for you. And his response was, you know, Lord, I don't want to trouble you. Mm. And, and, then, and then after that, God says, okay, you don't want a sign? Okay, tell me what you want me to do. Absolutely, absolutely. I think Carlton makes a point, and I think I need to move forward. Um, God always avails himself, and he won't force himself on us. But if we decide we don't need him anymore, he will simply allow you to be who you want to be. Mm. That's the point, Carlton. Can we highlight that, please, as one of the thoughts for the day on both live stream and also on, on, on YouTube? Because that's the point. God always availed himself and he won't force himself. But if we decide we do not need him anymore, he will simply allow you to be who you want to be. And that is the unpardonable sin. Okay. When you refuse to accept that there's grace available to yourself. Amen, amen. I say amen to that. Indeed, indeed. We're battling against time as usual. But I've got another question for you viewers. Matthew 5, 14 tells us we are to be the light of the world in these dark Co well, in, in, we need, we're to be the light of the world now in these dark COVID times that we are living in. How have you or can you be a light in the world? So you may already be a light, but in these dark COVID times that we're living in, share with us how you may already be a light or how you can be a light in the world. Let us have your thoughts and comments on that. Um, the remainder of Isaiah 60 develops the theme of all honoring God in his city. Um, Sister Nicole, we're going to now to Isaiah 61. What's going on in the opening verses, please, of Isaiah 61? Verses 1 through to 3, please. Yes, in Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And here we see um, Isaiah prophetically speaks for the Messiah. The Messiah announced that he is blessed and empowered by the Spirit of God. And the, the verse starts, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And in Luke 4, verse 16 to 22, over 500 years later, we see Jesus spoke these same words in the synagogue. And he opened the scroll to, to Isaiah and read from the beginning of that chapter and the first lines in, in verse 2. When he sat down, he simply said, today... This scripture fulfilled in your hearing is basically speaking about me. The anointed one, the incarnated God, Jesus in person 
is described here in, in, in Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3. He is the one that the spirit of the Lord is upon. And then it continues to say, because the Lord has anointed me. And this shows that this Messiah, this anointed one, has been purposed with an important and essential task. He's been set aside to do the work of reversal of the plight of human existence. It is for the poor, for the brokenhearted, for the captive, for the oppressed, for those who mourn, those who are sad, those who are loaded with pain. The Messiah's mission was focused on these situation mm. and these individuals. And we see that fulfillment in Jesus's life and his ministry. And so you can clearly see that Isaiah is speaking prophetically about Jesus. Okay. Great, great, powerful. Thank you very much. Um, Elder Peter, what additional light can we glean from Leviticus 25 verse 10 in, in line with some of the things that we were just talking about is in terms of the acceptable or favorable year of the Lord, please? Okay, uh, Leviticus 25 verse 10 says, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. Now, I hope I could explain this quickly. I'm going into teaching mode here. Right, seven is a, is a special number in the Bible. We've got the weekly Sabbath, which is every seventh day or from Sabbath to Sabbath, that's eight days, including the Sabbath end to end. Um, and that's about rest or honoring God. Now we've got the day of Pentecost. Pentecost comes from the root pent, means five. Pentecost is 50. Now, 50 days after the Passover was Pentecost, the day following seven weeks from the Passover, that's seven again. Now the year of Jubilee came every 50th year. You've got seven times seven years, which is 49, and from the beginning of that 49th year into the 50th year, the Day of Atonement, then we had a time for releasing people from their debts, releasing the slaves, returning property to those who owned it. And the year also was dedicated to rest, rest for the land, rest for the people alike. Now, the history of all of this is that before the Exodus, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Without freedom, they didn't have possessions either. Now, when they reached the land of Canaan, Joshua divided the land among the tribes and the families so that each had his own inheritance and every male adult became a landowner and the land was a permanent possession of theirs and couldn't be taken from their family. Now, if a man became poor, they could sell part of that land, but only temporarily, and it will always revert to them or their descendants at the year of Jubilee. It be, if they became even poorer, they would actually sell themselves into slavery and work to pay off their debt, debts. And again, that slavery could only ever be temporary. When that great day of atonement came in the year of Jubilee, they came free people once again. So what made it acceptable and favorable to the year, as a year of the Lord? The um, year of Jubilee was a year to honor God right. and focus on him. And it also foreshadowed Jesus's future work on the cross. Okay. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he relieves us of all our spiritual debts and slavery to sin, giving us freedom. Great background. Thanks for compacting that so quickly so that everybody's clear what that was referring to. So, Elder Stanley, in case there is any doubt, you know, how was Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled? Uh, Luke 4, 16 through to 21, briefly, please. Okay, I'm reading from uh, King James Version. He said, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he went into the synagogue on Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach, deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set a liberty that are bruised, to preach the acceptable will of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue, were fasting on him. And he began to say unto them, the day is this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So it's just to affirm the accuracy of the Bible. And it helped us to expect the hope in future 
So the prophecy has to feel here because this was what was we saw in Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3. But if we look again in Isaiah 42, 1 to 8, it again was stated out there, if I can read. Say, Behold my servant, whom I uphold my elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cast his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised red shall he not break, and the smoking flask shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor dis dis discourage. Till he has set judgment in the earth, and the eyes shall wait for his law. Thus say God the Lord, he that created the heavens, that straightened out, he that spread for the earth, that which cometh out of it, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and we hold thy hand, I will keep thee, and give thee a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to the, open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will not go to another. Neither my praise to graven images. Amen. Amen. Thank you for clarifying that. So everybody saw that the fulfillment of that prophecy. Pastor. If I don't read Sister Saul, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to read a comment from Sister Saul. She right. says, God does not only forgive us. It's a past point but he has to reclaim us back into his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a critical point. You asked a question earlier, Johnny, as to how people can um, be a light. That's right. Uh, Michael from Tobago says share our, sh he, sh he shares our link mm. with others. Amen. Th thank you, Michael. Keep sharing. Amen. And ask them not just to, not just to share, but yes. to subscribe so they can be a part of our worship experience. Alana, she shares her testimonies. Elaine, she shares her friendship, caring and, and helping in health. Um, Elder Mwami says, living a life for Jesus. And, and um, Marie says, to be the light means in the time of darkness, we offer hope, encouragement, kindness, compassion to those in need. So doing you prepared them to receive um, Jesus as life. Hello, Sister Marie uh, Kutian and Clive over there. I think you're in California. God be with you at this time until you come back. Um, Sunson said, we are, we're a conduit of God, of, of Jesus is the light, which means to shine through us about sharing the light. Tandy says, um, let's keep Tand Tandy's point, we've discussed that. Bibi says, she used her device to send out the good news of salvation. Thank you for that. Um, Juliet, we have a duty of responsibility to go into the world and preach. Keep going down for me. Um, um, Margaret says, in, in St. Vincent, be a light by giving to those in need, encouraging them, practicing hospitality, feeding, feeding the hungry, that's a powerful point. Ash says, there's, uh, there's no such there's no, there's, there is no such a sermon or light greater than living as Jesus could have Amen. lived on earth. Thank you. Karen Beebe says, confessing and forsaking sin. Jesus said, just like Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more, sharing the good news. Um, very powerful, powerful point. Um, Colette says, we don't pause because of COVID. We should continue to practice what we have committed to do, sharing, caring, helping as best as we can. Fantastic, fantastic mm -hmm. point. Um, we have in our studio, in our church studio, a very good friend of mine who has been doing a lot during this COVID time. Personally, I know, I know where he sleeps sometimes. <laughs> um, my very good friend, Pastor Vili, share your thoughts as to how you have been a light during this COVID time. Pastor, thank you for having me uh, in your program today. Um, it is a privilege to be back at Croydon. Um, this is a very tough question. It is a very tough question because I am tempted to look at myself as not, not uh, being what I'm supposed to be. Uh, also, I'm tempted to look at every single bit that I've done as it. That is what I was supposed to be and that's what, uh, that's what I was supposed to do. Um, allow me to, to share just one thought. So take one minute and share with us a few things that you have been doing. Yes. What I've been doing? What I've been doing, I've been uh, um, driving around London, collecting food, distributing food to people. Um, I have been uh, spending Tuesday nights at the night shelter. And um, I have been uh, going to, to the sea to baptize people one at a time. 
Uh, these are basically the things I've been doing. Uh, sharing the gospel um, through social media, uh, Zoom, uh, and I have to confess to you that I am absolutely amazed by the responses of young people. Amen. Young people are asking the right questions. I, I was about to ask you the question about the young people in your church and what, they, what they're doing for, in terms of shedding the light of Christ. So take another 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Doing something for others. I don't need 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Billy. Thank you. Over to you, Elder Johnny. <laughs> amen, amen. Um, going back to Isaiah 61, verse 2. Amid jubilee celebrations and good news, the day of vengeance is also mentioned. Now, Elder Peter, expand on this for us, including when this prophecy is fulfilled, please. Right, I'll expand. I don't need 30 seconds either. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was reading from the book of Isaiah, he specified that Isaiah 61 verse 2 was fulfilled on the day that he was speaking. That's verse 21. But he stopped short of mentioning the day of vengeance, because as we may be aware from Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, this divine vengeance will occur sometime later at the second coming. Oh, wow, concise, excellent, thank you very much. Now, Elder Stanley, um, it is said parents shouldn't spare the rod and spoil the child. And in some cultures, as we know, um, this was exercised to a, a far greater extent than others. Um, somehow, the words, we beat you because we love you, doesn't quite cut it for those receiving those healing licks, um, those, uh, whatever. Um, now, tell me, how do you reconcile the words of comfort from a loving God with promises of vengeance at the same time? The only way to reconcile is that we, we know that our God is a loving Father and is righteous and pure. So he has given us that free will uh, to make the right choices. And the Bible also told us that the wages of the, uh, sin is death. So there is nothing hidden there. So it's to balance it up. I just want to read now, 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 now in chapter 1, verse 2. He said, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. And the Lord had his way in the wild wind the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So whatever we do, we need to know the consequences. And the day of vengeance will come. This has been predicted and it's, going, it's coming soon because we can see that the signs and symptoms are there. Okay, thank you. Um, anything to add, Sister Nicole? Yes, thank you, Brother Johnny. As, as Elder Peter mentioned, there's quite a long period between the accept, acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. And here we see how Bible prophecies, they can shift gear and the time frames can shift really quickly without warning because the Messiah is, is not only coming about righteousness, but it's also about justice. And so if I could just paraphrase, it says, he sent me to proclaim the day of vengeance of our Lord. I believe it's referring to, to, to sin. And because sin is a crime, it has to be avenged. The day of vengeance of our Lord is relevant, as, as Elder Peter said, to the second coming of Jesus, where the earth will be made free from sin. Because see, God cannot be a part of sin. He, he has to be absolutely separated from it. And it said in, in Nahum 1 verse 3 that God will, will not acquit the wicked. Therefore, he has to confront it. And, and, and so this is that day of vengeance um, of, our, of our God that has to occur. Amen. Thank you. Before panelists, I take your final takeaway comments. Pastor, what's our final comments coming in online? Um, Karen says, when, when any of my work colleagues tell me that a loved one has COVID, my immediate response is, I'll pray for them. I'll follow up and always ask them how their loved one is doing. Um, JB says, um, the rod is used by the shepherd to guide sheep, not to beat them. Mm -hmm. After a while, the shepherd just speak and the rod is not needed because the sheep know their shepherd. It depends on how stubborn your sheep is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commend all people um, everywhere to repent for. He has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Um, Sister Margaret says, I've been sharing virtual services, gospel videos, encouraging families, um, encouraging families and, and friends daily. 
praying with and for others. Catherine Joseph says, to let our light shine is to be like Jesus, encouraging, sharing what we have with others and tell them about Jesus' love. Um, I, you know, let me just throw, um, Sunson says, spare not the rod and spoil the child. Traffic lights are in place for a reason. Ignoring red light will lead to consequences. Um, and that is true, Sunson, because if you do not, if you do, um, if you, if you use the rod, you'll be in big trouble, mm -hmm. um, just to let you know that too. So there's responsibility on, on both sides. Um, Judith over there in Falmouth, Jamaica says, read aloud Isaiah 55, 6, and praise God for his promise. Also Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 25. I think there's a comment that I want to read, the final comment there. Um, you, are free, um, you are free to make whatever choice you want, but not free from the consequences mm. of those choices. Thank you, um, Croydon SD Outreach. That's, we all have consequences. God is a God of love, but also a God of justice. I sealed over there in, in, um, in New York, um, just said a while ago. Thank you, thank you. 30 seconds each panelist, we're running right out of time. Sister Nicole, your final takeaway, please. Yes, and thank you for having me on the panel today. So my final thought would be that the one person we need most is Jesus. In, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let us look to Jesus and not to ourselves. Let us believe on him as our living Savior because the mercy of Jesus is our only hope. So be encouraged, my brothers and sisters. He will take us through. He will show us the way to go. His word is truth, and he will give us a fulfilled life. Amen. Thank you. And Elder Peter. Well, I'll use Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18 because I think that summarizes well what we've been discussing. It tells us to put on the full armor of God uh, so that we can resist the devil's schemes because our wrestling is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and spiritual wickedness in, in high places. Now physical armor is not sufficient when we're fighting a spiritual battle. David, when he was fighting Goliath, he discarded the physical armor he was given and clothed himself with God's spiritual armor and therefore defeated the enemy. And similarly, attempting to earn salvation by what we physically do is not sufficient. We need to discard our physical attempts to earn salvation and release ourselves to God's spiritual offer of redeeming us when we believe in him. And the final verse 18 says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's children. God Amen. bless you. Amen. Thank you. And Elder Stanley. I'm, I'm taking my one from Romans 13 verse 12. He said, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So my plea this afternoon is just for us to make choice to leave the way of Satan behind and make every day choice for God because every day is a different day. The anointing of yesterday is different from the world of today. So we have to continually plug into that light so that we can be able to overcome the ways of the devil. Amen. Amen. And Pastor Vili, our, our surprise panelists, what's your takeaway thought for our listeners, please? I would like to uh, read something from Second Peter, and I'm going to read from the message translation. So uh, those of us that are not too familiar with King James and other translations uh, may be a little bit confused, but it's going to do good to your soul. Since everything here today might be well gone tomorrow, do you see how essential it is to live a holy life? Daily expect the day of God, eager for its arrival. The galaxies will burn up and the elements melt down that day, but will hardly notice. And I do believe and I wish you the Holy Spirit's guidance and the presence of Jesus in your life every day. Amen. And Pastor Royster. I think Billy's trying to take my spot to be co-host. It won't happen, Pastor Billy. Um, <laughs> Um, Patty Morgan says, justice, justice demands penalty. Jesus paid the price of sin in order to, to acquit the wicked. But if we do not accept Christ, we'll experience the vengeance of God. So you cannot have justice without vengeance. Mm. And that's the, you know, and without comfort. That's what justice, it brings comfort to those who, to those who have been set free and vengeance to those who stand 
accused. And before I go, Elder Johnny, um, I, can I say a, a special wedding anniversary to my good friend and your good friend, who 16 years ago went to the parish of St. Anne in Jamaica. I think his name is Andrew um, Newby. Oh. And, and Sister Karen Newby. Oh. So they're celebrating today their 16th wedding anniversary. Amen. So on behalf of the pastoral team and the members, our online viewers and the members of Croydon Church, we wish you, um, Sister Karen and um, Andrew, who are our family life leaders, we wish you many more happy returns. And I'm sure you will pray for them in the closing prayer. I will do. Thank you very much. We're right out of time. My takeaway point for you is we have a choice of belonging to the nation of light that dispels darkness or a nation that cannot see the light. Let's choose today to arise and shine. Thank you all very much for your time and for working so hard behind the scenes um, to everyone. And thank you to our ultimate pro producer and sustainer, that's our God in heaven, that kept us going. Next week, we look at the rebirth of planet Earth. Please don't leave us. Stay with us as we go into our divine service, but let's bring our Sabbath school to a close. Dear Lord, we want to thank you so much for your blessings. We want to thank you that you are the desire of ages. You are the desire of nations. Help us, dear Father, to recognize the task that you have called each and every one of us to do. We're thankful for your mercies and for your goodness and for those that have been able to celebrate today, including Sister Karen and Brother Andrew celebrating 16 years of married life. Please continue to bless them and help them to continue to focus on you because you are the one that keeps us together and sustain. Please bless us and keep us, dear Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen.